Welcome to Destiny. We're so glad you're here. Take a look at what's going on here at Destiny Church. We only have one week left until Easter. On your way out, make sure to grab as many invites as you can and pass them out to everyone you know. Services will be held at 7 a.m., 8.30 a.m., 10 a.m., and 11.30 a.m. Remember, there will be no 6 p.m. on Easter Sunday. Can't wait to see you and your loved ones next Sunday. Baptism Sunday will be on April 28th, the Sunday after Easter. Make sure to visit the Welcome Center after service to sign up or head over to destiny.online for more information. Good Friday is coming up. We will be having service Friday evening. We hope to see you there. Mark your calendars. May 5th will be our Life Group launch party. Life is better together. There will be plenty of groups for you to get connected, so come have fun with us. Check out the Welcome Center for more information. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of service. Welcome, everybody. Glad to be here today. Amen. Uh, just so you know, after service, you can um, head out and uh, talk to the people that pray down there. They're launching something so magnificent that's really life-changing. And, uh, you know, if you are up to what's going on out there, uh, Disney just launched a whole subscription-based kind of new thing. And it's kind of the new technology that's out there, but Pray.com has been working on it for a very long time. And so you can actually go back there, uh, get all kinds of Bible stories and apps and all that kind of stuff. You can work out to great things. So go find out what you can get over there. It's going to be fantastic, and uh, we're excited for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Palm Sunday. Glad that you're here. You ready to get in the Word today? Come on, can you stand and give our online audience a big, big, big round of applause right now? God bless you. We love you. Thank you for watching. Open up your Bibles, if you can, to Galatians chapter 6, the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter, and we're kind of coming to a conclusion of a, a mini-series that we called Scars That Save, and then we're preparing for Easter, and then baptism weekend after that, and it's going to be fantastic. Galatians chapter 6 beginning in verse 7, and I love it. It says, from now on, do not let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that I show that I belong to Jesus. Think about that. I bear on my body the scars that show that I belong to to Jesus. I want to talk to you today on this Palm Sunday, a message entitled, When the Saint Came Marching In. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation. Give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray you give us a mind to perceive, a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we will never, never be the same. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you have a message outline, our ushers would be more than happy to get you one. We've been in this series Last week, Pastor Jeff kicked it off here, Scars That Save, and I was um, at our South Bay campus, and it is phenomenal what's happening over there. Um, it was amazing to be there, seeing so many new people on that campus, and it's absolutely incredible. I told them, I said, man, you guys don't need me, and they're like, yeah, we don't need you, and I'm like, good, because I'm going to stay in the desert, you know? But you know, we've been talking about this season that we're in as we step into Holy Week and really the scars of Jesus. And, and when you think about 
the scars of Jesus, there were seven wounds on his body, but two scars. And both his hands were pierced. We saw that both of his feet were pierced, and then his side was pierced in his head and his back. And we'll get a little bit more into that this Wednesday and also this Friday. But there's a reason why those marks were on his body. They're significant to your life and my life in the freedom that we live in by living for him. Basically, a scar simply means that you were stronger than what tried to hurt you. It's what a scar really is. If you're like myself, I, I, I remember I was seven years old and I was riding my bike and, and I wanted to be Evil Knievel. I remember Evil Knievel, right? And I wanted to be Evil Knievel and I wanted to, I, I, I wanted to, 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 you know, my friends would lay out, you know, they'd have courage to do that. I, I was never that person that would lay on the ground. I'm like, no, nah, I don't trust you. And, um, but, but I was there and, 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 and we had um, uh, wood and, and it was leaning up against crates. And, and so we had crates. And so, so I thought, man, we're definitely going to do it. Here I am. I'm going as fast as I can on my bike. And next thing you know, when I hit it, it literally fell apart. I landed up tumbling, and I landed up getting a big gash in my knee that my mom had to take me to the hospital to get stitches. Well, every time I'm lotioning my legs or something like that, I see that scar that's still on my knees. That reminds me of that accident that took place when I was seven years old. It's something that as men, we can kind of share. I told my son, I said, look at my knee. I got this scar. He's like, dad, how did you get that? I said, by trying to be evil Knievel. And he was like, who's evil Knievel? (laughs) Well, at the end of the day, it's, it's scars that really show or are the proof or the evidence that at one time you had a wound on your body. There was a reason why Jesus made sure that his wounds were still seen so that they could be the evidence of the very fact that he took those wounds for our lives. And so you have wounds today in your life. You have have scars in your life today. And for for so long, the church, in some sense, has been almost afraid to talk about its scars or talk about its wounds. And and I really believe the greatest The greatest thing that you can give to somebody that doesn't know Jesus is your transparency. Kind of talking about the pain of your life and talking about how you overcame those. I've learned something that you really can't talk about what you haven't overcome yet. And so the fact that you're able to talk about these scars that we all have in our life, in some sense, give people hope that if God did it for you, come on, he can do it for me as well. So what do scars remind us? Scars remind us of certain things. First of all, scars remind us that sin is painful. It it reminds us that 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 is painful, that when Jesus was on the cross, those scars that that were left had some pain attached to that. And and it reminds you and I that, that, that sin is painful. The next thing is that scars remind us not to make the same mistakes again. I don't know about you, but I'm not gonna play evil Knievel with my son. I'm not going to get some boards and some crates and, and try to be, you know, evil Knievel. No, I, I messed up one time. How I many know I'm not going to mess up another time? So, so scars have a way of reminding us, don't do that, okay? Don't make those same mistakes. The third is scars help us to teach others. It helps us to teach others. We all have scars in our own lives that in some sense they were mistakes. Maybe they were done out of disobedience. But even in your disobedience and even in your mistakes, you can show others not to make those mistakes as well. And so you shouldn't be ashamed of those scars that you have in your life. Also, scars on our bodies teach us that we're still useful. Just think about that for a moment. My knee got, got, got all jacked up, but I could still run. I could still play. I could still walk. At the end of the day, scars even remind you and I that the places that we had pain in, God still can use those areas. God can still use those things 
in your life. And then lastly, scars remind us what's bleeding today can be healed tomorrow. What's what's bleeding today can be healed tomorrow. And so God has a way of doing all this. And we're going to talk about that on Winning Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. And then also this Friday is Good Friday. And and Good Friday services will start at 630. And so you're going to want to get here. Listen, um, I, I want you to know something about Good Friday, just that, that, that you have an understanding of it. It was the darkest day ever recorded in history. Science, scientists would tell you, it was the darkest day. If they can ever trace anything back, it was the darkest day ever recorded in history. Yet, for you and I, it was our brightest day. And so listen, listen, it is going to be, we're going to have communion. It's going to be fantastic. So get here this Friday. This is Holy Week. I mean, this is a week in which I go to church more than Sunday. Okay. I'm going to get here 630, have communion. And then also remember that next Sunday is our Easter services. And we have a seven o'clock, 830, 10 o'clock and 1130. And so when you, when you, got, when you came in and, and, and maybe when you leave today, you can grab one of these cards. What's cool about this back part of the card is that you just put your picture or you open up photos to this, this barcode right here, and it brings up a video of an invite from Lisette and I. So I was, at the, I was at the coffee shop, and so I carry these in my back pocket, saw a friend of mine. I said, hey, man, you need to come to our Easter service. He's like, oh, great. What time are they? I said, well, here's a card. Pull out your phone. And so he, he pulls out his phone. I said, what do you want to pull out your phone for? I said, put it over this. And, and so he did, and he was like, video came up, invited him to come. He's like, wow, man, that was cool, man. It starts a conversation. And so this is a great opportunity to invite friends and and be here for Easter Sunday. But we're going to be talking about these scars. We're going to be talking about the scars that Jesus had on his life that literally changed our lives. When Jesus was, was on the cross, the Bible describes us that he looked like a lamb that was slaughtered, literally just wounded, 39 stripes on his back, a crown of thorns on his head, piercings in his feet, in his hand, and also on his side. The Bible talks about Mary and and them went to go see him. I want to see him in the grave. And as she's headed towards the grave of Jesus, thinking, maybe I'll just stand at a distance in the tomb while he's there. There came a man that was walking towards her. She kind of just kind of walked by, and and this man stopped. She looked at him, and the Bible describes to us that to her, she thought he was a gardener. And so when this gardener supposedly says her name, Mary, she recognizes the voice. The Bible says, my sheep know my voice. And, and, And she goes, Jesus. She couldn't believe what she saw because in her mind, all she saw of the last picture of Jesus was like he was a lamb that was slaughtered. And yet now, all of a sudden, he's almost completely redone. Friends, I could imagine that conversation going on in that tomb. I could imagine the Holy Spirit kind of cleaning up Jesus while, while he's getting ready to, to resurrect. And I could imagine Jesus in some sense saying, hey, don't, don't clean up my scars on my hands. Don't clean up the scars on my feet. Don't clean up the scars on my side. Yeah, you can brush up the back a little bit. Maybe you can kind of take the dots off my forehead from the crown of thorns. I don't want people to think I got pimples. But I could imagine that conversation. I can imagine the Holy Spirit almost saying, like, why would you keep those scars on your hand? I can clean those up right now. I can imagine Jesus saying, well, there's going to be some people that just won't believe that I am he that resurrected. And so, so, so Jesus comes out of the tomb, and she sees Mary, and Mary runs back to the disciples, and she's like, Jesus is alive. Everybody was kind of nervous. They were, they were all locked up in a room hiding for their lives. And Jesus appears to them. And they look at him and they start eating with him. And they're like, man, this Jesus is alive. 
the one disciple that was absent was Thomas. So Thomas comes back from a venture, and, and they're like, Thomas, you're not going to believe this. Jesus is alive. He came to visit us today. And Thomas is like, yeah, right. Come on, he was dead. I, 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 he was on that cross. He was beaten. There's no way he's alive. The Bible talks about the second time Jesus appears. And he appears to Thomas. And Thomas looks at him and says, if it's really you, let me, let me, let me, let me put my finger into your hands. Within every one of us is a Thomas. And I really believe that the three times Thomas actually speaks in Scripture is that God is trying to show us a pattern, a pattern on how you and I walk this faith out. Think about the first time Thomas actually speaks. Here's what he says. I'll go with him wherever he goes. I will go with him wherever, ever he goes. Isn't that us? When we first get saved, we get saved and we come to the knowledge of Jesus and we're like, man, I'm going to go anywhere. I'm going to go everywhere Jesus goes. Man, I'm going to be at church early. I'm going to be the last one to leave. We're all gung-ho about Jesus. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says this about Thomas. The Bible says this in the book of John. It says, and, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too, watch this, and let's go die with Jesus. Like, like when we first get saved, we're so excited about Jesus. We're like, I can't wait to go. I'm going to live for him. I got saved at destiny. Oh, man, it's all about my destiny. And, and we're excited. We're at church every Sunday. We come to church on Wednesdays. We served on the dream team. Man, I'm telling you, we get plugged into life groups, and we're all excited. Man, it's all about Jesus. And isn't that in some sense how all of us start? And yet somewhere in this pattern, we land up getting stuck. Where do we get stuck at? Scripture shows us. Because, because Thomas goes from, I'll, I'll, do, I'll go anywhere, I'll go everywhere with you, to the next time Thomas actually speaks, he actually says these words, I don't know where I'm going. I, I don't know. I, I don't know where I'm going. Here, here's, what, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says this in John chapter 14. It says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this was, were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? This is Jesus talking. And he's saying, I'm going to be leaving you guys. I'm going somewhere to prepare a place for you. Like what he says, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. And look at Thomas's response. No, no, we don't. We don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man gets to the Father except through me. Listen, every one of you will land in this place multiple times in life. You will, you will sit there and you will start off like Thomas. I'm with you all the way, God. I'm going the distance, Jesus, to the point that when your fire begins to dim and your walk begins to slow down, it's not because you don't have faith. And it's not even because you lack love. Matter of fact, it's not even because of what's happening around you, the storms you may be going through. When you land up starting to doubt the one that you were just so excited for is when you finally come to a place where you're sitting there and you're saying, I don't know where you're taking me. I have no idea. 
God, you told me to follow your ways, and I followed you, and I'm all excited. And all of a sudden, you get to a place in your life when you're looking at your future or when you're looking where you're at, you're sitting there saying, wait a minute, God, this does not look like my plan right here. This does not look like the future that I had for myself. And the whole time Jesus is telling Thomas, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm preparing a place for you. I'm preparing a place for you. And Thomas looks at him and says, but I don't know where you're going. I'm stuck. Can I tell you something? That every single day, Jesus is still saying the same thing. I'm preparing a place for you. I'm preparing a place for you. He's preparing your future. He's preparing your tomorrow. He's preparing your next week. He's preparing your next month. And you want to know what happens? You want to know when we start to doubt? We don't doubt because we lack faith. We doubt because we don't know where he's taken us. And so all of a sudden, you mean to tell me that I got to walk this thing out with you when I don't even know where I'm going? Oh, yes. You better get to stepping. (laughs) Even though you don't know where he's taking you. See, it's easy to trust somebody that can promise you where you're going. When you can see them, but it's when you can't, and you can't see it, all he's wanting to know is, will you trust me? Can I ask you a question? When has Jesus ever led you to the wrong place? Just just think about, just think about Jesus, man. He's born to Mary and Joseph. For 30 years, he's a carpenter. He's building tents. He's building all these homes and furniture for people. And he knows that wasn't his destination. That was just his preparation. And all of a sudden, he's like, okay, my time has come. Oh, my God. Hashtag OMG. This is my moment. My moment. And and I could just tell him he's on his way to the Jordan. So he's going to the Jordan. And he's like, yeah, this is a familiar place here. No one knows it, but he does. And all of a sudden, he gets baptized. And when he comes up from the water, the, the skies open up. I mean, God's voice speaks. And it says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The dove lands on his shoulders. And he's like, yes, I'm anointed. I can't wait. The Holy Spirit's on me. I can't wait to do ministry. Jesus, where are you taking me? God, I mean, God, where are you taking me? I can't wait to go change the world. And God says, oh, I'm leading you into the wilderness. I could just imagine Jesus looking at God and saying, going Gary Coleman on him, like, what you talking about, Willis? You know, (laughs) why would you take me there? But he had to be led. What about David? David's in the back of the fields. Man, David is killing a bear and a lion. Samuel the prophet comes. He's getting ready to anoint the next king of Israel. Tells Jesse, gather all your sons. God gathers all seven of his sons, brings them on the stage, and Samuel's like, nope, they're not here. He's like, oh, here are all my sons. He goes, nope, they're not here. And he goes, come on, man, these are all my... He goes, no, you have one more son. Jesse... It's like, oh, yeah, he, he's in the back of the field. He goes and grabs David. Soon as Samuel puts his eyes on David as he's coming towards him, he says, that's the one. David's like, oh, my God, no more being in the back of the fields. No more hanging out in the mud. No more having to fight these wolves up. And then Samuel takes the big ram horn that's filled with oil. The angels begin to sing, and they pour the anointing over oil over, over David. And David's dripping with oil because he's now next the king of Israel. And all of a sudden, God says, oh, by the way, Go back to the field. David's like, wait a minute. I thought I was supposed to go to the palace. I'm the next king of Israel. See, it's interesting because when God opens up doors for you, you assume I'm going to the next place. But sometimes what God does is that he leads you to a different place because he just wants to know, are you willing to trust him when you're going somewhere that doesn't look like where you're supposed to be going? Come on, am I talking to somebody? So we get frustrated. We don't get frustrated because we lack faith. We don't get frustrated. You know, so here's what we do. Oh, no. If if I don't know where I'm going, but being led by you, then let me take the control. And I'll lead my life 
to where I believe I need to go. See, Thomas didn't doubt Jesus. His doubting began when he started to doubt where he was going. It's why people, I remember growing up in church and people would tell me, well, I'd be like, man, I, I just don't know where I'm going. I don't, I don't know what my life, well, you need to pray more. You need to fast more. And I'm like, yeah, I do that, but I'm still lost. At the end of the day, our doubting begins when we stop trusting him where he's taken us. So he starts off with, I'm going, at, I'm going ride or die with you to I don't know where we're going. To the next thing he says, I need to see it to believe it. I need to see to believe. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says this, but he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound on his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. So this is the second time he's about to appear. I love this part. This is my favorite part. The doors were locked for their safety, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. I kind of like that. He kind of goes superhero on them, kind of goes right through the wall. And they're like, wait a minute, we didn't open up the door. I know the door was locked. I love the fact that we can have some locked areas in our life, but even Jesus can come in. Come on, are you hearing me? I'm just going to step into that thing right there. And, and, and look what he says. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said, listen, then he said to Thomas, like he knew it. Thomas, hey, I saved these for you right here. And he says this, look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Just believe. He went from ride or die to I don't know where you're taking me to I have to see it to believe it. Isn't that the pattern of the church? It's ride or die. I don't know where you're taking me. Oh, I have to see it to believe it. Friends, there's a Thomas in every one of us. And every day, we got to turn our Thomases into not the Thomas who doubted, but the Thomas who triumphed. The Thomas who believed and therefore landed up becoming one of the greatest disciples to win so many people to Jesus. All of this would have never happened if Jesus would have never made his way into Jerusalem 1,500 years ago. The Jews were taught to grab the best lamb, to choose it so that it could be celebrated during this Passover time so that the king can start coming in. Holy Week is all about the entrance of the king coming in. And in Mark chapter 11, it gives this significant story, but I kind of want to dig deeper a little bit because I want to show you that you're actually part of this story. In Mark chapter 11, verse 1, it says, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. He says, go into the village over there. He told them, as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied that, there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front doors. As they were untying it, some, by the stand, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt of Jesus to Jesus, and he threw his garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, praise God, blessings 
on the, on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here's the thing that I love about Jesus. The thing that I absolutely love about him is that Jesus has the way of showing you something now that you have no idea it's part of your future. He, he kind of has this way of like, you're going through it today, but you don't realize that you're actually even in your future. Like, I'm experiencing it now, but my now is part of my future. And sometimes what we, what we fail to recognize is we fail to recognize that because Jesus sits outside of time, we get so caught up in the now that we start doubting like Thomas. I don't know where you're taking me, our future. So, so Jesus just gets done healing Bar blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10, restores his vision, tells the disciples, go down and you're going to find a colt tied to the pole. And, and, and so, so these disciples are only doing something that Zechariah saw years before. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, the prophecy of this moment says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble. Watch this, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Isn't it amazing? That God can be in your now and at the same time can be in your future. And, and, so, and, so, and so, so here's the disciples. They're like, what do you want us to do? And he's like, you're going to go find a colt, a donkey. He's going to be tied to a pole. And when you go get that donkey, you tell the person that the Lord is in need of it. Now, in its original Greek, the wording is, the Lord is in need of it. It doesn't say, the Lord needs it. It says, the Lord is in need of it. Because God doesn't need anything. But he is God who chose that I will use mankind as part of my plan. So therefore, I am in need of it. And so every day, here's you in prayer. Oh, God, meet my needs. And God meets your needs. He meets your, your family needs. He meets your faith needs. He, meet, he, needs, he meets your financial needs. He meets your family needs. And he meets your friends' needs. He meets all your needs. But this is the only time that God actually shows us what he's in need of. And so he, he tells the disciples, go get that colt that's tied up. Now, here's what they don't realize. They don't realize that as they're writing this story, they are actually in the story. And the story is not just for you and I. The story is for them. He's showing them what your future is going to look like even though you're doing it now. And you think, and you think that you're just going down there to untie a, a donkey. But you don't realize I'm showing you what your future is going to look like once I'm gone and how to get me to the people that I'm in need of. Like a donkey. I, 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 can, I could preach here all day, man. I could call this, I wanted to call it the leadership lessons from a donkey. What we can learn from a donkey. First thing, like a donkey, every one of us needs to be redeemed. This story is being told. So, so, so he, he, the disciples are going, they see this donkey all tied up, and they tell the owner, the Lord's in need of it. Here it is. Here, here, here. 
Here's, here's what it's going to take for us to, to get the coal. They had to redeem it. That word redeem means to be bought at a price. All the way back in Exodus, God is speaking of this moment. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 13, it says a firstborn donkey, a donkey that has never been ridden, never been used, may be bought back from the Lord by presenting a lamb or a young goat in its place. But if you don't, do not buy it back, you must break its neck. However, you must buy back every firstborn son. How, 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 how did they buy that donkey? There was no money exchange. The disciples said the right words. The Lord is in need of it. The Lamb of God is in need of it. How were you bought back when you were tied up? held hostage, full of purpose, and full of destiny. And yet every time you tried to go, you were yanked because the enemy had you tied up and bound. The angel of the Lord showed up. The Holy Spirit showed up. The Lord is in need of it. The Lamb of God has requested that their life be redeemed that their life be redeemed right now. And you must let it go at the end of the day because he paid the ultimate price for your life. Think about that for a moment. The Lord is in need of you. Really, me? You mean to tell me the Lord wants to use you? Yeah. He doesn't want to use you like everybody else uses you. He wants to use you. And where did Jesus find you? He found you tied up. He had ascended to get you. And the only reason why the enemy had to let go was because he heard those words, the Lord is in need of you. How many people passed that donkey by? How many people saw that donkey every single day tied? Could you imagine? They'd see that donkey every single day. Poor old donkey. That donkey got no future. Man, I feel so bad for that donkey. That donkey is worthless. Not even knowing that that donkey was created for one thing. One day to usher the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords into Jerusalem on his way. And can I tell you something? It's the way so many of people saw your life, saw my life. Poor old bed. He's so messed up. Man, he has no future. He's an alcoholic. Man, he was hooked on drugs. Oh, man, his life is nowhere. How many people passed us by? How many people saw us in our worst but never saw us at our best? And all of a sudden, someone shows up and says, the Lord's in need of you. And that's why you were overwhelmed when the Lord showed up in your life. That's why you were so overwhelmed with emotion. Because for the first time, somebody believed in you that you were more than just somebody tied to your past. Because as soon as you're let go, you got a future for your life in Jesus' name. Just think about that. Think about, you want to, wait, wait, wait. I thought you just wanted to save me. No, I wanted to use you. No, I, I need to use you. No, you were created for me to use you. The donkey had to be redeemed. The second thing that had to happen to the donkey had to be released. It had to be released. The Bible says in Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says this in John 8. Look what he says. It's our theme verse for the year. So if the Son sets you free, come on, you're what? You're free indeed. So, so, so he just didn't, listen to me, Jesus didn't come to untie you so that you can go back and tie yourself up because it's what we do. When we start doubting where we're going, when we were all, oh my God, I'm set free. I'm, I'm all in with you, Jesus. You know what we land up doing? Getting ourselves retied. Back to things and places and people that have no future value for what's ahead of you. 
Jesus sets you free from relationships, and then you go back and tie yourself up. Sets you free from your past, and you go back and tie yourself up. Sets you free from all those doubts that you had of yourself, and then you go back and tie yourself up. Then you wonder why. God, why is my life not going anywhere? It's because you're tied up. You're tied up in habits of your past. If you're not careful, most people go back to living a tied up life because they don't know what it's like to really live in true freedom. At the end of the day, he just didn't set you free. He says you're free indeed. You're completely free. So he says, listen, you got to be redeemed as I close. Number two, you, you got to be released. And number three, listen, you, you need to run. This is, this, this is the part I love the most. You got to run. Because that, that donkey didn't just sit there and just, oh, I'm going to live a slow-paced life. No, no, no. He was carrying the Savior on his back. The same way you and I being his disciples carries the cross on our back. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Can, can, I, can I tell you why? Can I tell you why Jesus said, throw it off. You want, to, you want to know why every time he comes to untie you, he always says, throw it off? Because the story tells us that, that not only did Jesus ride on the donkey, but he also placed garments on the donkey. You can't wear doubt and then expect God to clothe you with blessing. You can't wear fear and expect God to clothe you with faith. No, you, you got to take one off. You got to take it off. See, where do they even get in their minds? They're going to wave palm branches. Where did that thought even come from? And the Bible says that they, they spread their clothes before Jesus and they began to wave them at his feet. Where did that thought even come from? Then they're going to grab, grab palm branches? Why? Well, Mark chapter 10, Bartimaeus is blind. He yells out, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stops. The crowd is saying, be quiet, he ain't listening to you. And the Bible says, he shouts even louder. I like that part. Because the world is always going to try to quiet your praise. And all of a sudden, Bartimaeus consents. He can't see, he consents that he stopped. And Jesus asked the question, Think about this. Jesus asked a question. What do you want from me? Like, like, like as if he doesn't know he's blind. He's blind. I can't see you. What do you want from me? Notice Jesus never said, come to me. He says, what do you want from me? I want my sight back. And he said, oh, okay. And before Jesus can even respond, you want to know what, what Bartimaeus does? takes off his garment. Want well, to know why? Because in those days, if you were sick or had a disease, you had to go before the Roman government to plead your case so that you are authorized to beg. They didn't have cards. They had coats with colors. And if they found that you were disabled and unable to provide for yourself, they would give you a jacket, a cloak. Whatever color represented your disability. Even till this day, disability has a different color. Go to the parking lot. Blue. Look at a blind man. 
If it's half red and half white, he's 50% blind. We still color coat disability today. We got that from the Romans. And so what, is, what does he do? Every day, he woke up and he put this on. This met his needs, but it did not set him free. This right here put food on his table, but it did not achieve his dreams. Every time he put this on, he was putting on and confirming to himself, you're always going to be blind. You're never going to be cured. You're going to have to learn how to deal and live this kind of life. When he found out that the miracle working Jesus was in front of him, you know what he did? He didn't sit there and start running around. He didn't sit there and start praying. No, you know what he did? He needs to do something every one of us needs to do this week. Take off what you're not supposed to be wearing. Because some of you don't even realize how much you have learned to live with the things that you're not even supposed to be wearing anymore. You're, you learned how to live with fear. You've just made it part of your life. You learned how to li live with brokenness. You just sit there and say, well, that's just the way it's always going to be. Who said that? Who's, who, who said this is the way it's always going to be? No, you've just believed that lie from the devil. So every day you put it on. You put this on. I'm going to put it on. I'm going to put it on. And you know what he did? He took it off. Matter of fact, the scripture says he waved it at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus looked and said, oh, 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 oh. You have that kind of faith? Okay. Give me your blindness and I'm going to give you sight. And his eyes opened up. His whole life, he begged in front of the temple, hearing stories of Jerusalem. So when Jesus told the disciples, go, go and get that colt that's tied up in Jerusalem, who do you think went with them? Bartimaeus. You don't think this was his opportunity to go? And so when, so when Bartimaeus gets to Jerusalem, all those people recognize who he is? And they're realizing, where's your cloak at? You can see? I can see. How did it happen, Bartimaeus? Oh, when Jesus showed up, I took off my jacket. I waved it at his feet. And I got my sight back. And can I tell you something? I'm here to grab that coat right there with the disciples. And we're going to take that back to Jesus. And in just about four more hours... He's going to come riding through this place. And when he does, if you want the miracle that I got, then get something in your hand. If you don't have a colored cloak, then grab a palm tree. But just have, oh, just have something in your hand that you can wave at his feet. And if you do, you will not leave that place the same in Jesus' name. Come on, are you hearing me today? Pastor, what are you saying? Let's never come to church without taking something off and putting something on in Jesus' name. That's, that's, that's what this week is all about. Can I tell you, it's more than just palm branches. It's about taking something off that you are no longer qualified to wear anymore. It's about taking pain and brokenness and hurt off and put on wholeness, healing, and health on your body. It's time to take off that doubt that's been in your closet too long. Those empty dreams, those broken dreams that you've allowed to sit inside of your drawer and occupy space. It's time to have a spring clean out right now. To go home and say, you know what, I'm taking, I'm getting rid of all these things. Because I'm not called to wear those garments anymore. Come on, my eyes are going to be open to the future that God has for my life in Jesus' name. It's what I'm called to do. It's what I'm called to do. It's what I'm called to do. And as long as you continue to put this on and get comfortable with it and settle, yeah, my marriage is always going to be like this. Who said that? My children will always be like this. Who said that? My family will always act like this. Who said that? 
Every time that comes out of your mouth, you stop yourself and say, oh, that's one more thing I got to take out of my closet. I can't wear it no more. I'm going to wave it at the feet of Jesus, and I'm going to have an exchange in my life. You've been redeemed. You've been released. Come on, and now it's time to run. And you run that race, and you run free, and you run whole. And don't be like a Thomas. Get stuck where, you's not, where you have no idea where he's taking you. I can tell you this. Over the last six months, you know, I fasted. I told you I fasted for 40 days. I'm on another fast right now. I'm not, trust me, I'm not trying to lose no weight. But every time I find myself in a place where I don't know where he's taken me, and I can't quite understand it and comprehend it, then you know what? I know what to do. I know to, I know to, I know to deny this part. And so this morning when I woke up and I had my cup of coffee, but them eggs were calling my name, I said, oh, I'm taking this flesh off of me right now because at the end of the day, I'm going to put on a garment over me today that I'm going to wear. God, I thank you that I, God, I'm going to trust you. I, I know what you're doing. Listen, I don't know what you're doing, but I know you're doing something. Okay. You don't know what he's doing, but don't be stuck. Listen to me. We give Thomas a bad name, and we preached it wrong in the church, and we made people feel like, well, if you doubt, you're in drought. No, no, no. Thomas didn't doubt because of Jesus. He would have never showed up to the room if he just wanted to quit. You know when he started to doubt is when he did not know where he was going. Don't ever look at somebody and say, you need more of Jesus in your life. You need to pray more. No, no, no. You need to help show them the way. That's all you need to do. And when you get stuck and you don't know where you're going, you just remind Jesus, show me. Show me, God. Show it to me. Reveal it to me. And I promise you, he'll tell you to do something you've never done before. This week, as we're on Holy Week, Wednesday, I'm going to preach on the crown. Can I give you a little sneak peek what it is? Come on, can I give you a little sneak peek what it is? If he's a king that they wrote, because there was not three nails on the cross, there were four. That fourth nail was on the top that hung the sign that says, this is the king of kings. But if he was really a king to them, why did he not have a crown of gold on? A crown of gold. Why was it a crown of thorns? Want to know why? Got to come Wednesday. No, no, no. You want to know why? Here it is. Here it is. It's going to get you fired up. We're gonna, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to loose this place on Wednesday. Watch this. Jesus came as the second Adam. Because the first Adam messed it up. What was the curse when Adam sinned? Came from the ground. Thorns and thistles. You want to know what the purpose of a thorn and a thistle is? Choke the harvest. You want to know why he put a crown of thorns on his head? Because God had to remove the spirit of poverty. Yeah, some of you are like, whoa. Yeah. You want to know why his side was pierced? Want to know why his side was pierced? You ready? You, I'm telling this so you can tell everyone to get here on Wednesday. Want to know why? And the scriptures all say it came out the same way. Blood came first, then water. Because the first Adam, when God wanted to give him a bride, it came from Where? So when the soldier could have did it in his back, but had to do it on his side. And the Bible says blood, then water came. Blood meaning your salvation. Water meaning your baptism. Because the bride will come. Come on, talk to me. Oh, you better be here on Wednesday. It's going to be fire up in this place. If you know anyone that's living a dark time, I'm not going to speak that long. It's communion. It's a 
hour service Friday, but I'm going to talk for 15 minutes on how to live your best days in your darkest time. It's going to revolutionize. Friday, 6.30, and then Sunday, 7, 8.30, 9, 10, 30, 10 and 11.30, and it's going to be awesome. Father, we love you today. Thank you so much for every person that's here today. God, we absolutely love you. You're incredible. You're amazing. We thank you that we're able to take things off so that we could put things on. We thank you that we're that colt. We're that donkey that at one time was tied up. And Lord, you loosed us. You caused us to be released. And then you told us to run this race. As your heads are bowed and your eyes closed, you're here today. And you say, Pastor Obed, I still feel like I'm tied up. I still feel like I need Jesus in my life today. On this beginning of Holy Week, I want to make sure that I'm riding into this week with Jesus because I feel like I'm tied up in sin, tied up in pain, tied up in brokenness. And if that's you today and say, Pastor, would you include me in this prayer? On the count of three, I want you to lift your hand. Say, Pastor Obed, I need Jesus in my life. One, two, three, lift him up wherever you're at. God bless you. 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 Anybody else? God bless you. As your hands are lifted. As your, all our ushers are doing is putting something in your hands. All it is is that the reason why I'm on this stage today is because somebody, when I raised my hand, put something in my hands that told me what my next step would be. You took the best step. It's our job to help you with the next step. And that's what we're going to do right now. As your hands are lifted, we're all going to say this prayer because you don't have to. From this day forward, you never have to do this again. You never have to, you never ever have to walk this walk out. I really believe you believe you're making the right decision for your life. You're going to change. You don't have to try to change. The Holy Spirit will change you. Let's pray. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Jesus I am saved now. My sins are behind me. My destiny is ahead of me. I'm asking now the Holy Spirit to come in me, to guide me and teach me every day about Jesus. I commit my life to you and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. And all God's people say amen. Come on, can you clap? Like you know, folks got saved today. Amen. Wednesday, please, if you can, text SAVED1 to 44622. It'll help you. We'll send a devotional to you, everything like that. Come on, make sure you go see Pray out there. Stretch your hands for the blessing. May the Lord bless you. Cause his face to shine on you and his blessings go before you. We bless you in the name of the Lord that the rest of this week will be the best of your week. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen. God bless you. We love you. Be blessed, everybody.